Welcome to you all. Thanks for being here. John Bernardi, let's begin with you. Why did you make this documentary? Well, Tom, thank you. We, as a coalition and as a regional consortium, we had seen a number of documentaries that were produced nationally and uh, from other regions. And we had some issues with many of them. Sometimes it was length. They were too long for classroom settings and other groups. Sometimes it was content. Some of them were very raw, very graphic, uh, and weren't necessarily suited to school settings and youth settings. And uh, we thought we could do our own. And I pitched the idea to the Spark Steering Committee, and they um, supported that idea. And I volunteered to work with my friend Bruce Carlin at Carlin Media. He and I have done a number of projects together over the years, and we work really well together. And, and he brings a tremendous amount of uh, expertise and creative energy to the process. And, and I brought the messaging and what we wanted to accomplish. And we put our heads together, and we put together a, a, a large group of people from throughout the region to appear in it. And uh, it turned out to be really great, and we're proud of it. Uh, what we do with it now is really important, and we plan to do extensive outreach with it. We'll be in schools, we'll be uh, in many organizations across the region. Uh, and uh, one of the greatest assets that this documentary will bring is as a discussion starter. And we've already seen that it has the capacity to do that. And as you heard in the documentary, awareness is a huge part of combating this epidemic, and we felt that the documentary would be a tremendous tool toward that end. So we set out to do our own, and I think it's as fine as any that are out there. And you talk about the message. What is the message? What's the audience you're targeting? Well, it's actually a broad um, audience, um, certainly youth and school-age children. Uh, we plan to uh, utilize it in that setting, but it appeals to adults, families, uh, people from all different demographics. Uh, and um, we hope to create awareness, of course. We hope to um, uh, relieve the issue of stigma so that people who need treatment and are seeking treatment feel proud to do so um, instead of ashamed to do so. There, there's still an issue of people hiding in the shadows because of stigma and, and shame. Uh, and if people want treatment, we want them to be proud of that. And as a community, we need to embrace that opportunity and uh, reduce that stigma. And of course, prevention and hope and access to treatment is, uh, also, are also goals. The documentary highlights Sparks' efforts over the past couple of years, the guest speakers who have packed the Strand Theater and SUNY Plattsburgh Fieldhouse, talking about their and their loved ones' struggle with addiction, a screening of Chasing the Dragon, a very realistic and tragic look at the cycle of addiction. You reached 1,000 people that night with, with that documentary. Is Spark working? Are the group's efforts having an impact? Definitely, yes. Um, definitely, yes. If, if nothing else, awareness has been raised a tremendous amount. We've also mobilized a number of resources, and it's not unique to Spark. We have a regional consortium, Spark, ECHO, the Essex County Heroin and Opioid Task Force, and the Franklin County Prevention Task Force as well. So this regional consortium has made tremendous strides. Uh, we, we've increased access to services like the facility that Connie has opened. Uh, much needed and will save lives. There's no doubt about that. That came in part due to the efforts from Spark and the, and the consortium. Uh, we've had tremendous um, support from elected officials, Assemblyman Jones, for example, who provided the funding for this documentary, among other things, uh, and um, the, um, the outreach to schools and the um, access to services is improving. So there's no question. Uh, that we've made progress. We have a long way to go. We've only just begun. We have a long way to go, but um, there, there's certainly progress that has been made. And let me invite everybody to weigh in now. We hear about the efforts in the three counties. Are they making a difference, do you think? 
Absolutely. On behalf of the Franklin County Prevention Task Force, we've mm -hmm. been uh, working together collaboratively as a group in our county uh, since 2005. Uh, so we have an extensive history of, of working together. We've done a variety of different things in our communities, um, you know, whether it be an educational forum or hosting a conference or a training, uh, providing Narcan training uh, to various groups. So we've been very active uh, and we have uh, a lot of teamwork coming from our two, three providers, I should say. Uh, St. Joseph's Addiction Treatment and Recovery Center, Citizen Advocates, also known as North Star Behavioral Health, and St. Regis Mohawk Tribe. And they are a very strong collaborative group, and uh, we're working to do more work in the future. And Terry, much the same in Essex County? I believe so. I think um, I've only been in my position for a year. So what I'm learning is that um, historically, the number of individuals that are coming together and working at this important topic is is sort of new in our area. And it's amazing to see the Essex County Heroin and Opioid uh, Coalition come together and, and bring people that have never really worked together um, on, on a, a topic that's important. And Dr. Ken Hall is the Chief mm -hmm. Medical Officer at CPPH here in Plattsburgh. From your point of view, are we making progress in fighting this epidemic? Yes, uh, we are absolutely making progress in a number of different fronts. Uh, if you just look at what's gone on in the last two or three years as it relates to the number of deaths uh, per population in um, Clinton County, it has gone down. We've cut it almost in half, which in and of itself is just, is just a great thing. I think that one of the best things is that SPARC as a coalition has brought together groups such as the hospitals, such as uh, Alliance for Positive Health, such as Champlain Valley Family Center, in such a way that we can start to coordinate things, that somebody can come to the hospital, can come to the emergency department in a crisis, can be taken care of, and then can be handed off to somebody else who can, who can then pick up the ball and run with it so that they can get further care. I think that that's, that's a huge thing that I would say before Spark, really didn't exist. And now, I, w I would not say it's fully formed, but I would say that we're well on our way to, Be to get what we need. Beforehand, to. they would get up and leave the emergency room. <coughs> Absolutely. You don't know if they would be going to seek treatment or if you'd be seeing them again within a few days. And we didn't even have the opportunity to, to get them somewhere, even if we would try. That, that didn't exist, or it didn't exist in a way that was o open to us. Now with the, with the facility in um, Schuyler Falls, that's changing. With the affiliation with uh, Connie's group so that they now bring people into the emergency department who can, who can talk to people who have gone through uh, getting uh, Narcan and being revived so that they can actually talk to somebody and, and start that process is, is just a huge thing. So there are more options for doctors and for staff as far as treatment options. Absolutely true. And you mentioned Narcan. Is, mm -hmm. is that the lifesaver? We know that Alliance for Positive mm -hmm. Health in Plattsburgh has been giving out Narcan kits, emergency kits, um, and people are training and learning how to use these, the, the nasal spray. Is this making a difference? Is this saving lives? That's making a huge difference. And, and I will tell you that not only is Alliance for Positive Health doing that and they started it, but that now in coordination with the emergency department at CVPH that we are also giving that out and then we're handing them off to Alliance for Positive Health to do the education treatment follow-up. So again, it's the coordination. More people that have these and use these, it's making a difference. I think that they should be in every home in the, in the uh, North Country. And is this <coughs> the easiest and most affordable, the, the nasal spray, the Narcan? It is, uh, it, is, it is easy, it is affordable. Uh, it also comes as, as a needle, which people may be a little bit more afraid of, but actually may actually work a little bit better. So I would offer either or both. And eventually <coughs> down the road, possibly an EpiPen, if the price can come down, that it, would that be an easy, if even we, easier for folks to use? If we could get there, that would be fantastic. <coughs> Great, thank you. Connie, your facility has opened. It has. It opened uh, the end of December. And <coughs> you've been working 
for this for a number of years now. This yep. is detox and rehabilitation together. You have 18 beds in Schuyler Falls. How much of a difference is this going to make having this now? Well, you know, I was just watching the video again, and when Ron Garrow said that it will save lives, I absolutely believe that. Um, I had a meeting with Ron earlier today, and 17 of our 18 beds are full today uh, with plans for, I think, a couple of folks will be moving on and three more admissions this week. So we'll be at 18. Up to this point, people have had to drive to Canton, then Governor or Albany. There was nothing local. Now having this option, are more people choosing to get the treatment instead of having to wait to get into one of those beds somewhere else in the state and changing their mind? Absolutely. There's so many barriers in terms of getting one of those beds. One is time in terms of the wait list. Number two is transportation, how are you going to get there? And so often not being able to coordinate those two on a timely basis, we, we lose the people. So this has been a huge need and now it's being It's filled. open and, um, and we're doing a lot, of, uh, a lot of work out there. The Terry St. Joseph's is a renowned addiction treatment facility in Saranac, like we heard from Bob Ross in, in the documentary. Mm -hmm. They're in the process now of opening a detox unit as well uh, in the Tri Lakes area. That's correct. That's and correct. for Essex County, that will be another option. You now have Clinton County to come to, but to have one right in Saranac Lake in, in Essex County will be will be good for your county. Absolutely. To to go from zero to potentially two resources is is just something that we never thought would be possible. And Suzanne in Franklin County, St. Joseph's is working on a facility there. Will that simply be housing or will there be treatment options there eventually as well is the hope? So I think you're referring to the Elm Street project. Yes, uh, yes that's going to be primarily housing. However, there'll be a number of providers available to pro um, provide services to the individuals there. Um, the other aspect that St. Joseph's is working on is the open access center that will be affiliated with their detox and that open access center will be an opportunity for people to go uh, get some information perhaps get a referral to you know Connie's agency or some other place but uh, lots of information there and available um, and I think also uh, to know North Star Behavioral Health Citizen Advocates has the Crisis and Recovery Center in Malone, New York, which is available to people who are experiencing a mental health crisis, may not necessarily warrant hospitalization, uh, but once again, a stabilization center uh, for folks to go to if they are in need of immediate services. With the treatment facilities open, Connie's is open now in Schuyler Falls, <coughs> Essex County coming in, in, in Saranac Lake, mm -hmm. Essex Franklin County, mm -hmm. we know. Uh, is this sufficient or is there still a need for more treatment facilities and are any on the horizon? Well, I think that's difficult to gauge just yet. Um, we have 18 beds and I'm not sure how many St. Joe's is. <clears throat> so that's gonna be 28 beds in the North Country. And so uh, speaking on behalf of Champlain Valley Family Center, you know, what I'd like to say is a year from now, after we've had a year of operation, I'll be happy to come back and answer that question. Mm -hmm. Is there funding from the state or federal government that's helping to make all this happen? Our funding comes, uh, we get assistance from New York State Office of Alcoholism and Substance Abuse Services um, to help offset some of the costs. And same for St. Joe's? Certainly for St. Joe's, yes. They have their uh, inpatient facility, uh, which is a per diem right through uh, Medicaid billing and other various insurances, but yes, uh, certainly uh, state aid funding is available. Just this week, the Recovery and Jobs Act has been included in Governor mm -hmm. Andrew Cuomo's $175 billion budget proposal. It would open up a new tax credit for businesses who hire recovering addicts. Both Assemblyman Billy Jones and State Senator Betty Little lobbied for this last session and Spark pushed for it as well. Mm -hmm. And now they're seeing this placed into the governor's budget. They're saying that's a huge step forward, a good sign. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Assemblyman Jones has been a champion of this right from, right from the get-go. He, he uh, was uh, involved in the early planning stages of this bill and has been a champion of it right from the get-go, as has Senator Little. 
Uh, both have been very supportive to the regional work that we're doing. Um, Assemblyman Jones is at the table um, often with us uh, and has put money on the table and put his time and rolled up his sleeves and he's been a tremendous champion and this act is successful largely due to his efforts. And he couldn't be here with us tonight but we did catch up with him uh, during the week and here's what he had to say about it. We do have an addiction crisis going on here in New York, in the North Country, in the nation and uh, very happy to see uh, my recovery and jobs bill included in the executive budget and we'll keep uh, pushing to have that stay in the budget and uh, I feel that this is a, uh, a program that will work for people in recovery. We know that people in recovery need good stable jobs um, and uh, we feel it's an important piece of legislation and I'm happy to see it in the executive budget. We believe that it will help people uh, that are in recovery and uh, looking forward to see it stay in the budget and uh, very excited about that. Assemblyman Billy Jones, how critical is this to helping recovering addicts as they rebuild their lives? Michael? So let me, if I can just go back and do the talk a little bit about Spark because there were a couple other things that we did. We, we did put together, when I joined Spark, I was one of the few people that were in private business. Spark was mostly represented by people that are working the treatment, law enforcement, prevention, those types of fields. And I said, if we're gonna do something, we have to do something together and we have to involve employment and private business. So we put together a coalition of employers in this area to talk about what we do to help people that are in recovery uh, to get and secure employment because many have checkered histories and things like that. And I will tell you without naming employers that we've had a number of employers in this area jump on board and do things above and beyond the normal procedures to allow people to go to work for them and have time off and things like that. The other event that we did, we put together a Live Well, Be Well event uh, in the fall of last year that was designed to get the recovery community and people who are not in the recovery community together to recognize that we can all coexist, get rid of the stigma and things like that. So I would echo what's already been said here that Spark is a terrific organization that's doing a lot of things. With regards to employment, what I said when I first uh, spoke to the assemblyman about the bill, I said, look, the easiest way to a private business person's heart is through his wallet and whether that's right or wrong it is what happens with people that are in private business that's what we look at so I said if you can figure out a way to do something that will offset some of the cost you'll probably be likely to get more employers to jump on board in our case it's a little different because I'm a member of the recovering community and have been for a lot of years so we're willing to take chances on people that are in recovery or you know come to work with a checkered history or any of those types of things but if we don't do something to get people after they've gone through Connie's wonderful program and many of the other wonderful programs that they go to, to have hope and opportunity, they just wind up falling by the wayside and going back through that. So anything that we do with regards to employment or future education is, is paramount, of paramount importance. Andrew, from the perspective of law enforcement, is this crisis getting worse or are we making progress in addressing it? We're making a lot of progress. Um, if you go back and you look at the um, drug arrest from uh, just 2015 uh, through last year, um, we've seen a, a drastic uh, decrease. Um, same things along the lines of um, uh, the, fat you know, the decrease in fatalities. Um, we're, because we're working, I think, very well through law enforcement with all the uh, partners that are, that are here, uh, the services that can be provided. Um, we're helping those individuals, those addicts that um, continue to continue to use, continue to be in the system. Um, but more importantly, uh, as in the documentary, you saw a lot of um, clippings from the Press Republican of arrests that have been made. Everybody's going to tell you we can't arrest our way out of this, but what we can do is we can, we can take the, the supply, at least slow it down, uh, that's coming into our area and our law enforcement partners and um, uh, my colleagues in Franklin County, Essex County, uh, more importantly here in Clinton County, we're, we're taking great strides to, um, uh, to slow that, that flow down and we've we're been very successful in doing it. The consensus, it's safe to say the consensus of law enforcement is to prosecute the dealers, the ones who are supplying the heroin and the opioids, bringing them, flooding the communities with them, uh, going after them, and at the same time, recognizing the need to treat those who are addicted. 
Exactly. That's that's the the route I think that at least Clinton County has been taking, and I know Essex County and Franklin County are following that. And Andrew, let me ask you, Plattsburgh recently joined four other cities in upstate New York suing opioid manufacturers. Are they blaming them for creating this crisis and are they looking to hold Big Pharma responsible and accountable, perhaps go after them to help fund uh, prevention, treatment and recovery programs? I think that's, that's the, the primary goal, is to obtain certain funding uh, through those agencies to give back to the communities that can help uh, continue with the, the programs that, that we've been talking about today. In the documentary, we heard from several students whose families have been torn apart by addiction. Chris, is this happening more often than most of us realize? I, I believe it is. You know, I, I want to go back to the, the big pharma question just for a second. Sure. You know, I hope through that lawsuit, um, as it was mentioned in the uh, documentary, that trauma generally results, and there, there is evidence that if there are trauma children, um, they're more likely to become addicts. Um, and the schools are learning a lot about trauma-informed education, but one of the things I would hope, if there is a lawsuit, that they would start at the, you know, the ground fo floor of the youth, and you know, some of that would have to be putting more counselors in schools. Um, having better programming to support students and especially after school programs. Um, I think that would be essential than other than just going about the recovery because if these kids have already lived the trauma, they are more likely to follow in their parents' footsteps. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as um, the one thing, children are trained to don't tell, don't trust. So oftentimes the, these kids are going through you know, households that are, that we can't fathom, um, but they're not advocating for themselves because they don't want to be taken away from their homes. So, and that was pretty uh, consistent theme across the conversation I had with the kids through the documentary. Um, and secondly, the students don't want to open up to school counselors. Um, they see their role as being different than traditional counselors. So. Many of the teachers may understand there's something wrong, but they don't know the full capacity of what's going on in these children's lives. And, and I think that's one of the biggest things we have to tackle. Are we seeing kids as young as school students using, or is, in most cases, their parents and they're caught up in this? I think it's more of their parents. I think the, the fact that students are coming to schools um, you know, they might not have nourishment, funds for the, in the home are not going towards food, um, or they don't have heat or whatever because of uh, the imbalance of the family budget going to use of drugs. Um, and I think they're not functioning well, they're misbehaving, their grades aren't, you know, up to the potential. Um, it's the root cause of why they're not successful in school, but it's not as though we're seeing these kids having the same addictive patterns in the middle and the high schools. Um, it's the, you know, it's the effect of their parents' uh, actions. So this is taking a toll on, on the students and their families. In many cases, if there are grandparents or relatives, they will step in and care for the children, but if they can't, then that's where we're seeing the other crisis here, the foster care crisis. Yes, Tom, we've seen a 90% increase in the urgent need for foster care in the last six years, 90% increase ac across the region. At one point, the rate of children in foster care in Franklin County, New York, with a population of 50,000 people, they had this, uh, the same number of children in foster care as Suffolk County, New York, with a population of 1.4 million. So you compare those counties to each other and you, you can really see the crisis that we have when it comes to the urgent need for foster care. We don't have enough of it in the region. Uh, and in many cases, children are being sent outside of the region for, for foster care, which comes at a great cost emotionally. Um, it's it's um, uh, more trauma for the children, they're leaving their communities, they're having to leave their friends and their relatives, on, in some cases their schools, being sent away for foster care to some faraway place because that's where it's available. And again, we've seen a 90% increase in the need for foster care in the past six years, largely exacerbated by the 
heroin and opioid epidemic. The call has gone out for foster parents. Have people been responding? Yes, it is. We've been, uh, United Way of the Adirondack Region has been working closely with the Departments of Social Services in all three counties to help raise awareness. Uh, and more people are inquiring about becoming foster parents or providing respite. Um, and we have a new pilot program that we're working with a number of partners on um, to engage the recovery community. So people like Mike and others who are passionate about their own recovery and have been successful in their own recovery uh, would, would be willing to help other people who are starting that journey of recovery and helping sometimes means caring for them, for their children. So it could be respite care for a few hours, it could be full-blown foster care, it could be mentoring or coaching for people who are in recovery so they can get their children back. Uh, and so it's, a, it's just a full gamut of issues and challenges that the child welfare system is facing in this region. Uh, Mike, last summer you proposed an idea to turn dorms on the former Air Force Base into temporary housing to help recovering addicts and the homeless get back on their feet. The town of Plattsburgh has approved the project. What's the status now? We're close. We, uh, we have a, a, an agreement in place with Clinton Community College. <coughs> Excuse me. There are two dorms that are uh, able to be inhabited as soon as we take possession of the property, and the dining hall is able to be used also as soon as we take possession of the property. There is a third dorm there that will need a significant amount of rehab if the need is there. We're suspecting that the lease arrangement and the purchase arrangement will be signed certainly by the 1st of February. Um, we're hoping for this week. Um, but we're looking to have people in there by the 1st of February. And I know that we have people, we've had a number of people who have contacted us directly or through agencies who are just on hold uh, waiting for the beds to be available. So we think that we'll, we'll have a need to fill a good portion of those dorms and there are 140 rooms. And if I could just tell you quickly what the, the purpose of this is, we're not a treatment center, we're not a rehab facility, we're not any of those things. We wanna be that conduit between when people maybe get out of treatment or get out of a halfway house or get out of incarceration for a nonviolent offense and have nowhere to go, need somewhere to live and just get on their feet at a very nominal cost, we wanna be that place. So they are effectively dorm rooms that are going to allow people to work on their recovery. And I'll, I'll tell you one other thing we're excited about uh, being able to use the dining hall possibly as, as a recovery center and certainly a place that we can teach people all of the other life skills that they may not have acquired in a 30-day treatment program or a 60-day treatment program. And we've had a great response from the community, both non-for-profit, government, and for-profit to want to be involved in doing this. So everybody sees this as a really good idea. So service providers are on board and teaming up with you. <laughs> Absolutely. And you know, Tom, if I could, it's worth mentioning that this is a very unique partnership, not done and uh, not replicated elsewhere that I'm aware of um, Mike's project. And, and it represents a very unique partnership between a private business and a private enterprise, the nonprofit sector, government, uh, and um, it, it's very unique and, and much needed. We, we have homeless people and people who are struggling with mental health and, and uh, recovery uh, addiction issues that are, um, again, like Mike said, have, uh, not able to access that transitional service. And so uh, that, that leads to relapse and other issues uh, because they don't have the support services they need and a good place to live. Uh, and so this is a very unique partnership on many levels. It, it meets a, a need that we have, a drastic need, but it also, the model is very unique and very cutting edge. Great. Folks, get your questions ready. Last question for the panel coming up. Connie, some spark money is going to a new program in the Clinton County Jail. What is the program? How is it going to help inmates? Um, this has also been another project that's taken a bit to get off the ground, um, but the policies, the procedures are done. Um, the agreement that we've uh, gotten together for the inmates who are at the jail to participate in the program is done. And I, bel I, I would estimate that probably over the next three weeks, there'll be at least five new people that will uh, you know, take up this other option in terms of uh, obtaining Vividrol.
and that's an option for inmates now? Absolutely, yep. And how effective is that? Well, um, I believe for folks, uh, you know, whatever the MAT, the individual is interested in, I believe number one, their willingness to participate with uh, whichever one, because there's options. Um, I think it's going to make a significant difference in recovery rates in our community. Great. Anything anyone else wants to add before we open it up to the audience and questions? I'd like to give a quick shout out to the four kids who participated. I thought they were awesome. They did a great job. They stole the show. Yep. Phenomenal. And they drove the point home about how it affects yep. students and it affects their families. Mm -hmm. And the availability. <laughs> and the availability. They basically said, you can find it anywhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's their mouths saying it. I mean, we have to listen. We had to be very careful about all of that. Chris was instrumental in lining up the kids, but the child welfare system's complicated and confidential and sensitive, and so we had a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross in, in order for that to happen. Um, but the kids were, they're just great kids and Connie hosted them a, a couple of weeks ago. We, we gave them a private screening of the documentary, the, the kids with their families. Uh, and it was very well received and I think yeah. overall they were just so proud they were. to be part of it. Yeah. Um, and, and the families were really proud. Yeah. 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 And Chris, for the folks who would look at that and say, wow, four of them in one school, you would say to them, that's that's, Th that's not a surprise. Not a surprise. I, I you know I would I would say off the top of my head I could have had twenty, and, and not that the kids themselves that you know they don't struggle with the use of drugs, but I know that they're impacted in one way or the other in their lives. Um, it's it's much larger than you think. To go back to answer your question, it it's pretty significant. Uh, my name's Ed Kirby. I'm a uh, a parent that did lose a son to this, uh, to this epidemic that we have. I really don't have any questions because the panelists, I think you did a great job in answering any question that, that I did have, but I do have a couple comments. And those comments, one mainly uh, to Spark, to this coalition, and to Bruce uh, from uh, Carlin Media, I think you've done an exceptional job at highlighting this epidemic, bringing every aspect that I can think of to the forefront for people to see. I don't think anything was left uncovered so for that I want to say you know awesome job the next part is is your panelists the panelists that are here tonight as individuals uh, I've, I've had the opportunity to be a part of of all of you but as individuals and as organizations I can't thank you enough for what you do day in and day out for really bringing this this issue that we have to the forefront and working hard to reduce what's happening out there. So on, on behalf of, uh, of a parent, and I know many more out there, thank you for what you do on a daily basis. So. Thank, you. thank you, Ed. Can I, can I just say that Ed, Ed Kirby's been a, a champion uh, right from the get-go, and he's a hero in my estimation. Um, and he says on the documentary that he's, got, he's on a mission to help one person avoid the pain that he feels and has felt in his family has felt and Ed's helped countless people, countless people. And he, he is always coming from the heart and um, is always genuine and has been a tremendous asset to, to our work and we hold you in the highest regard. Thank you and I do it to you guys as well. <coughs> thank you. Thank you Ed and thank you for sharing your story. Um, I, I before, think before Ed takes off, I mean just uh, people that have heard Ed's story, people that have heard my, my piece of, of Ed story it, it took him it took him a little while to build up the I don't know if it's courage or uh, you know the ability to come in and, and, and talk like he did um, at that spark meeting to participate in, in these types of things but um, I, he's heard it from me before but uh, he's, not, he's done an outstanding job um, representing parents of, of uh, family members that have, have been lost um, to this crisis and uh, I just greatly appreciate him finally uh, coming out and getting being come part, uh, part of the team. Hi, my name is Sue Martin. I'm a person who's been living and thriving in long-term recovery. I also was a very quiet member of the recovery community. That was my business. 
I discovered the damage I was doing by being quiet. And when my family member followed me into the world of addiction, I thought I'd know the way to find, his, find him help. And I hit walls. And I hit one wall right after another. We have to welcome people seeking recovery into our community. We're really starting to do that. I do see that we're starting to do it. But we still have times where I'm being told that people aren't willing to aren't willing to find treatment when that's just not the case. They're begging for treatment and the blockades and the delays and the, uh, the lists of requirements are blocking the access to treatment. So we need to open the doors to treatment. We need to welcome our loved ones with open arms when they're finally willing to accept treatment. And even when they're not willing and they're court ordered into treatment, that still helps them find it. Sometimes the ears come open. So that's my access to treatment is my biggest thing. By the fact that you guys are here, that's getting us some access to treatment. And that's mostly what I wanted to say. And if you have any recommendations. Sue, I, I, you know, I really value your comment. And uh, I know those hurdles when we've attempted to refer people out of outpatient. And um, I know that in town there's three outpatient providers. There's Clinton County Addiction. Conifer Park and Champlain Valley Family Center, and I believe that all have moved toward ac open access. Mm -hmm. And that means if you want help, give us a call or just walk in our front door and you know, let us start r right there when you want it. And in terms of referrals to the other levels of care that the individual would make, I know that all three outpatient clinics in this community uh, are doing that. I, I should, I'll speak for Champlain Valley Families. So I know that we're doing that. Yes. And, uh, and the, the new beds and the openness, because when people are in the inactive withdrawal and they have to wait for a bed and they're told, we lose them. just do what you have to to get by, that's not a good answer. No. So these two facilities opening up, prayers answered. Thank you very much. Can I just respond yes. to, the recovery? to the recovery piece that she talked about? You know, it's there's no part of me that wants to be the poster child for recovery. I don't want to be out here saying, you know, this is recovery or any of that. But I will tell you that your comment is profound. And the more people that we can bring who are in long-term recovery out into the public who are willing to say it. And that doesn't need to be spoken in specific terms. We don't need to talk about all the things that happened to us or any of those things. But if we're not out there in the forefront celebrating this, how do we expect people who believe what they read in the paper or any of those other things to not understand that there are people who are successful members of the community in recovery? And I know there are people in the audience are in recovery because I know some of them. And I will tell you that you can, you can, all of us know people that are in recovery, rather, whether you know it or not. That's how many people there are. You would be floored if we took the top off and said, all of these people in Plattsburgh are in recovery. And that's not our business to do it, but it is our business to convince those people that it's okay to say, I'm somebody who struggled with this and now I'm a member of the long-term recovery community. So that point is well, well received. And one of the things we're looking at, Sue, I think you'll be happy to hear is using Spark and Echo and the Franklin County Task Force as a platform to potentially bring friends of recovery to the region. Um, and what we hope that will help with is um, really, as you and Mike just said to really embrace recovery and to involve more people like you who are willing to get up and yeah. speak about it and, and um, address foster care and any number of other issues. And so we're, we're hoping to really bring friends of recovery back. I think it started and fizzled and we're gonna bring it back and yeah. make it work this time. We'd like to see it up here. Yep, we're gonna have it. So can I yep. just add one more thing for a second? You know, I think when, when Mike says we need to celebrate recovery, I, what is so important about that is children have the stigma too of their parents. They don't see it as a celebration. They want to hide it, they do, and they're not going to advocate for themselves. So the more our community can celebrate it, you know, they can, they can reflect and say, okay, my parent had an illness. Right. That doesn't have to be me, and I can celebrate that too. You know? And I think uh, the impact of celebration would help kids greatly. Great, thank you, Sue. And just to pick up on Sue's point, there are more beds now, but are there still hurdles? 
are, are, are folks still facing issues with cost, with insurance, and a number of other hurdles as far as getting in the treatment facilities when they need to? Um, I don't, I, I can't speak to a lot of hurdles because we've just been open since the end of November. Um, you know, and I mentioned earlier that we're at 17 and we have 18 beds. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I know that the need is great and hopefully we're going to take care of a lot of it, but I don't know if it's going to be enough. So I guess I, I would say that I think that there continue to be hurdles. I think that we're breaking them down. I think that, I think that Connie's facility being open since, since the fall is great, but the reality is it's new. It's full or nearly full, but it's new. And developing the way to transition people from one entity, the hospital, to another entity, that facility, takes a little time to smooth those things out. And, other, and in the meantime, people can, get, people can get stuck. And it's new, we need to communicate it better so that everybody knows that it's there, so that they say, hey, this is, this is a resource that we can use. So we're, we're getting there, but we're a work in progress. And does insurance cover much of this, or is this out of pocket yeah. for a lot of families in an issue? That's true. Yeah, uh, insurance with parity, mm -hmm. uh, that, that law, yep. that helped because substance abuse uh, disorder is seen like any medical right. uh, disorder. So yes, that's, that's been very helpful. Mm -hmm. I, we are encountering some hurdles, um, and, and given the fact that people have started to seek recovery in a way that maybe more of them in you know numbers have increased so many of us are struggling with workforce issues and we don't have enough staff to meet the need which um, I'm grateful that people are coming out to get treatment but we're by that pressure we just don't have enough staff and that's, that's I think it's safe to say you and Suzanne would agree that the county clinics that you oversee and operate are overwhelmed at we are a, overwhelmed. a large extent mm -hmm. to a large mm -hmm. extent. Well certainly Franklin County privatized their uh, SUD clinic many years ago but I can speak on behalf of our providers that definitely we need more professionals in this line of work yes. absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can I just add, in the, in the, and remember, in the mind of an addict or an alcoholic, and Ed Kirby in the documentary pointed it out, there is a very small window when somebody gets to that time. There were many times before I got into recovery where I was probably ready, but that window was brief, 15 minutes, a half hour, an hour, two hours, maybe a day. So it is important that, that and I echo all the sentiments that have been said, but it is important that when somebody is ready to say, at this moment, I'm ready to go, that we get them there. I can assure you, Connie can tell you stories of people that on Tuesday they were ready to go, but she couldn't get them in till Wednesday, and on Wednesday they were not ready to go. So it is that important that we have accessibility at the time that they reach out. Our next guest is Bruce Carlin, the documentary producer who, uh, who made the film that we saw tonight. Bruce, welcome. Thank you. Uh, wonderful job with the, with the documentary. Well, it was, um, I mean, it's really all these people uh, and the, the kids and people being honest. You know, that was, you know, you don't know at the beginning. I wish I could have said when John asked me this, you know, do you have an idea of what it's going to be like or, you know, how long and, you know, that kind of stuff. We, we looked at the chase and the dragon which was very graphic and um, it was you know, pretty depressing. So we talked about what do you hope to have come out of this? Is it fear? Do you think, you know, scare people straight? You know, is it something, a positive message? And it was, you know, a positive message. And so you begin the interviews and then, you know, one of the challenges is, you know, winnowing it down. And there were so many good things that were said. One of the questions I asked um, law enforcement was, is it easier to get drugs than treatment? And you know it, it is and so that is one of the things that um, you know while they work on getting you know the drugs off the street you know this this treatment issue has to um, has to be addressed but um, like I said the honesty having people like Ed come forward with his you know heart-wrenching story Deirdre's story um, everyone's that, that was there uh, there was a lot that we you know talked about wanted to put in that the kids said that was just you know, it was too tough uh, as far as, you know, some didn't have, um, you know, 
custody, hadn't seen maybe their mom or their dad and hadn't signed off. So, so that was very challenging. And it was very interesting because what I thought would happen when we went in that room was we would have four kids or five kids come in and talk about their friends. And, you know, this is what I've seen, this is what I've seen. And they just went right in about their lives and they opened up totally. And it was very surprising to find out when Chris asked them, well, do you talk to each other about this? Are you supportive of each other? They were like, no, I'm not, I'm not telling anyone about this. This is, you know, I'm ashamed of it. So I was very, very uh, surprised at the comments of the kids. And, you know, it wasn't a good surprise. It, it uh, was very um, scary. And powerful for yep. the audience to hear mm -hmm. yep. them telling their stories. Definitely. Let me just add something Bruce and I have worked on in, I don't know, 10 or 12 productions over the years, and we work really well together, but we drive each other nuts, too, and we irritate the heck out of each other. He had, I don't know, four hours of footage that we had to put together into 35 minutes, uh, and so uh, there's a lot that we didn't use that is really powerful stuff, and we had quite a job of pulling it all together in mm -hmm. such a way that it would deliver the message and Bruce is a master at creative energy and like the Deirdre piece that I don't know hopefully you noticed how he did that it was just so tremendous like um, her well her story is compelling and when she says I lost my soul I get choked up every every time she says that but the creative energy that Bruce brings like maybe you didn't notice and you'll notice next time but her hiking up and running up she gets to the summit and she talks about what she's achieved and the winds blowing and the leaves are beautiful and the mastery of it just all came together really, really nicely. And you yeah. intentionally went for 35 minutes, right? You we did. wanted to keep it <coughs> mm -hmm. that length because you thought that would be better than a, a much longer Absolutely. documentary. Yeah. We wanted, we wanted like Chris's um, teachers and other educators to be able to utilize this in the space of a 45 minute class and then maybe have a discussion the next day or late, you know, after that. But we wanted it to be right in the 30 to 40 minute range. And Bruce, I'm sorry, you were going to talk about Deirdre. Uh, no, it was just, I, I thought we were gonna go mountain biking. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I, I didn't have a mountain bike, so I rented one and I had a GoPro. I thought this is gonna be nice, I'm just gonna, she's like, no, we're, she pulled in and there was no bike on her on her jeep and i said well she goes no no we're gonna run up this mountain <laughs> I'm like, said, you might run up it i'm gonna take a, a little more time but uh and, and uh but it was but it, it all worked out you know really well yeah. and uh i mean before each interview I, I had no idea what would come out of it there were tremendous things that came out of each interview um there were many things that people said that that echoed each other and um, it was it was you know very eye-opening you know I'm a father of four kids they're now having kids to see what they're gonna face you know in 10 years you know this gives me you know some optimism that the services the law enforcement community uh, the uh, not-for-profits are, are working together and that really when you have a problem you, you know you know, more heads working together to solve it the better so I salute all the work that you guys do day in and day out because uh, Dr. Hall, you're uh, in the emergency room, you're seeing this firsthand, Connie, you're mm -hmm. dealing with this. You're all dealing with these people in their real lives and this is life and death. It doesn't get any more serious. Bruce, thank you. Bruce, Coming I just in. want to go back to one thing you said about, you know, you kind of walked out of that um, panel discussion the same way I did, unknowing where these kids really are. It's like peeling back an onion. Um, and one of the great things for the Spark Coalition, we peeled back an onion with that, realizing, you know, Connie and John and I have talked quite a bit about this. We got to create something for the, the children, mm -hmm. you know, and there's, because it's multi-pronged like Mike talked about, yeah. but right now um, they don't confide in anybody. No. And, you know, and they Chris don't advocate for themselves. Out, you know, what can the school do for you? And to a kid, they said nothing. You can't do anything for us. And that's pretty dark. Hi, I'm Peter Regnier, I'm from Plattsburgh. Um, my question is really for you, John. As you look at, you know, and I'm a kid growing up and I look at the United Way and, and for many years it had been kind of the, the drumbeat or the thread was, was the same. Um, 
As you look back on your time at the United Way, how has the mission statement has basically changed the same, but uh, has stayed the same, but how about the scope and the widening scope and, and how you've developed from, from when you began to today? Could you explain that? Yeah, thanks, Peter, for that. Um, the important thing from my perspective in our organization is to be relevant, and that is the key word. And so if there are issues, um, we're going to meet them head on. We're not going to hide behind the something and wait till somebody calls us out. We're going to jump out in front of it. And uh, friends and colleagues rib me and say, I go looking for trouble. Um, and, and I think that's how you stay relevant. Uh, so w whether it's heroin and opioids or the urgent need for foster care or suicide prevention or other needs that we and crises that we have in, the, in this region, uh, we're going to go looking for trouble because I think that's, that's what keeps an organization relevant. Uh, and there was a, a young man who moved to the region a, a few years ago at Adirondack. He was working at Adirondack Medical Center and he came to our office for a meeting uh, about two years ago and, and I kind of took a shine to this guy, young guy, and, he, and I asked him if um, he wanted to get more involved with us and, and he said, well, I'm just new to the area and I've only been here a couple of months and I said, well, what do you know about our organization? And he said to me, well, I know that you're the premier helping organization in the region. And I said, bingo, if I could get 100,000 people to say that, then I could retire. Uh, but I'm a long way from that. Uh, and so we just try to be relevant, like all of these people do. I mean, Connie goes looking for trouble every day, um, as, as does everybody down this, down this row. Uh, and that's how you stay relevant. And otherwise, um, you just become stagnant and then uh, of no great value to the, to the region. So the short answer is I go looking for trouble. I'm a trouble seeker in addition to being a troublemaker. <laughs> Thank you for everything you do. Thanks, right. Pete. I, I really appreciate that. One thing about John, you know, mm -hmm. we started talking about the Spark Coalition, but the networking and all the work his leadership has done, it would not have been possible without him. I mean, great quality people follow good leaders, uh, and that's what he has put in place in this organization. Thank you. And our hats go off to John for his hard Thank work. You. I don't know if that's Thank true, you. but I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, I'm uh, Shane Dutel. My family owns the Indy Meats and Jesus and Crow Smokehouse. We actually employ a couple addicts currently, and we have in the past as well. And it's been pre uh, pretty successful. One's 15 years, one's going on three years recently, and one we lost a car accident, but he was still clean what happened. Um, I guess I do have a question because I've had lots of surgeries, and I feel like every time I come out of surgery, the doctors want to give you pain meds. What does the doctors... Uh, what kind of trainer are I going through to not do this? I lost a good friend and he was jumping doctor to doctor, getting scripts written like candy. And I feel like that's where a lot of people get starting a hook that could be wrong. I just, I feel like there needs to be some preventive measures at that level. Oh, and first of all, I'm, I'm sorry about your friend. And I think that your, your thoughts on that are pretty spot on in terms of how things get started in one of the ways may not the way, but one of the ways is exposure to prescription medications, whether it's prescribed to a person by a doctor because they've had an injury or, or, or an illness, or because they have access to it because somebody that they know has it, whether it be a family member or whomever. Um, there's a lot of conversation in the medical community about that, and we've actually, I would say thankfully, we've now started to take action in it. Um, the emergency department at CVPH has really led the way from CVPH's standpoint in terms of really looking at what prescribing patterns are and what medications are available to manage people's pain. I think that it's important for people to know that when you have an injury, you're not going to be pain free. It's going to be uncomfortable. We will make the pain bearable. We will make your, we will have you be able to do the things that you want to do. But being in pain, unfortunately, is a part of life. And us trying to take it away completely has probably hurt more people than it has really helped. I can tell you that in the larger University of Vermont Health Network, there's a lot of initiative across all of the facilities there in terms of 
of educating doctors and really monitoring and trying to look at how we can do a better job. And I can tell you that while how we measure it is imperfect, we're having an impact. We're having an impact here in northern New York. We're having an impact in uh, Vermont as a well. So I, I would say thank you for, for, for saying that, for really bringing that out. And yes, the answer is we do recognize it and we are working on it. Thank you. Shane, thank you very much. We thank appreciate you. it. Dr. Hall, let me follow up on that. The state has obviously taken steps limiting the number of days worth of prescriptions, mm -hmm. requiring training. <coughs> Have the steps been enough or is more, in your opinion, needed? Oh, there's, there's definitely more, more that need, needs to be done. I, I would say that one of, the big, one of the big issues that I honestly am concerned with is that, is that this is a pendulum. And we were way pegged over on one side in terms of prescribing a lot of medication, trying to control, trying to get rid of pe people's pain. And now we're starting to move the pendulum the, the other way. My concern is that we're not going to be looking at individuals as individuals, and we're going to treat everybody the same, and people are not all the same. Um, that we are, and that we need to educate doctors that that yes, there are ways to, to treat pain that are, that are beneficial to everybody, that don't try and take away everybody's pain, that try to allow them to function. But on the other hand, we need to say that, we need to not say, therefore you don't get any medication. That there is some reasonable place, and oh by the way, it's not just about opiates. There are other ways that people can, can uh, have their pain uh, managed. And as we see, law enforcement and pharmacies also teaming up and working together to increase uh, days that they'll take in the drugs so that folks can clean out their mm -hmm. cabinets and, <coughs> and take away the temptation and take away the drugs that we see some people target. So yeah, and we want to do more with that, Tom, the safe disposal programs. And I, I think we can um, create more opportunities for that across the region. And we've begun to talk about how we can do that with the hospitals and other other uh, entities within the regions uh, so that safe disposal becomes something that people are aware of and easy access and, and uh, effective. Great. I it, I'm sorry, yes, Tom, go right I, ahead. I sure. just think it's worth mentioning that law enforcement has been, the coalitions have really helped law enforcement be part of the solution. Um, I think in the past they've looked at addiction in one way and treatment providers have looked at it in a different way. And the coalitions have brought those two entities together and it's helping solve problems. In many ways, people worked in silos Absolutely. before and now yep. they're working and together. It's worked mm -hmm. both ways to Terry's point. I remember early discussions with Captain LaFountain and DA Wiley and others and, and there had to be good listening from all parties. It wasn't that the, the treatment providers were going to fix law enforcement and you have to do it our way. And it wasn't that law enforcement was going to say to the provider network or the nonprofit network, no, you have to do it this way. It, it was listening to each other and finding middle ground uh, that could be useful. And I must say that all three DAs in our region are very great, uh, good leaders and, and um, interested in, in creating a stronger and better community and we're blessed to have three excellent DAs. One of them's here this evening, but um, DA Carrero and DA Sprague are also outstanding people and that helps a great deal as well as the sheriffs. I mean, we're, we're blessed in this region. I say on the documentary, this is the greatest place on the face of the earth. I mean that. There, there isn't any place that has a better capacity to work together, um, solve problems, be compassionate and empathetic with each other. I, there's no better place on earth than, than here for that, and we're very proud of that. Great. 